In Ukraine, the strategic eastern city of Severodonetsk fell last week to Russian forces, marking what some Western experts called a critical point in the conflict. So where does it go from here? At the weekend, G7 leaders restated support for Kiev, but will the heavy weapons they promised arrived in time to boost Ukraine's fortunes on the battlefield? My guest this week has an unusual role in this war. Ilya Ponomaryov once sat in the lower house of Russia's parliament, then became the only member to vote against the seizure of Crimea. He's now in Kiev and says Vladimir Putin's war aims go way beyond Ukraine. It's NATO that's firmly in his sights. He wants to crush NATO. Uh, uh, that's his strategic goal, to crush NATO. As for Russia itself, Ponomaryov says a civil war is inevitable. But what of the many Russians who prefer stability, however repressive, to freedom? And what kind of Russia will emerge once all the guns are silent? That and much more on Conflict Zone. Ilya Ponomaryov, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thanks for having me. Hello. Let's talk first, if we may, about the latest developments in the war from your standpoint, how critical for Ukraine was the loss of Severodonetsk in the Donbass? It was not uh, critical to my mind. Uh, it was a planned loss. Uh, the current tactics of Ukrainian army is just to suck as much blood from uh, the invaders as possible and to make them pay dearly for every single meter of the territory that they uh, capture. So they slowly retreating, uh, but uh, altogether, the uh, losses over the last uh, month and a half, uh, they can be counted with just several kilometers of uh, the territory, but uh, they have been paid with thousands and thousands of lives of uh, Russian soldiers. But this was the largest uh, city Ukraine still held in the Luhansk region. Any hope that they could take it back once heavy weapons arrive in greater numbers from the West? Uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, it, it, it is the large city, uh, relatively. It's uh, 100,000 uh, inhabitants there. But uh, Lysychansk, which is right across the river, is the same 100,000. So it's just slightly smaller, but uh, more or less they are of the same uh, size. They are, they are not major cities. Uh, but the, the same Mariupol uh, that was in Donetsk region, for example, is 400,000 people. Kharkiv is uh, uh, more than a million uh, you know, Kyiv with 5 million people. So uh, the, they're not large cities. It's just that uh, the Russian propaganda, the Kremlin, wants to look to make victory look, look significant and important. You mentioned uh, Kiev, the renewed attacks on Kiev. Uh, we've seen the attack on the shopping center in Kremenchuk yesterday. Um, what does this say about a new phase in Russia's tactics? Is that how you see this? What are they moving towards now? I think that this uh, tactics existed uh, from the very first day. Uh, they want to provoke Ukrainians to revolt against their own government. They, uh, they want to provoke internal tensions uh, within the country. So they just uh, were acting like terrorists, which uh, try to uh, disseminate terror and horror within uh, the ordinary people. That's, uh, that's the only thing, because uh, it's, it's not a military object. Uh, there are no uh, stockpiles of explosives there, as they claim to be. There, there, there are no uh, military regiments uh, uh, located in those uh, trading centers. It's a deliberate attack on the civilian infrastructure. Let's go back to February, if we may, just before the start of the war. You didn't believe the warnings from the Americans that Putin was going to invade, because you said he'd be signing his own death sentence. We're now more than four months into the conflict. Do you still think that death sentence is pending? Absolutely. I think that the uh, countdown has started already. And I think that uh, it's the last year of Vladimir Putin's life. I uh, don't know whether he would survive the next New Year holidays. Uh, maybe yes, maybe not. But uh, I think that uh, his time on this planet is about to end. What makes you say that? Uh, it's uh, the uh, atmosphere in Russia. 
now a lot of people are very much unhappy with what's going on, especially Russian elites, uh, which uh, felt under uh, foreign sanctions, and uh, especially Russian government. Uh, because they see the dead end in the economy, they see this the situation is not going uh, anywhere, and uh, the most uh, poor circles uh, of the society, uh, uh, the discontent is, is uh, growing there as well. Uh, they are the main uh, donors uh, for this war uh, in terms of people. Uh, that's where the recruitment is coming from, and at the same time, they uh, suffer the most from the rising prices and the deficit and the unemployment. Uh, so I think that at one point in time, those two uh, 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 d d discontent processes would collide and uh, would create a major explosion uh, in the social life in Russia. Discontent is one thing, but you've been talking in the past about a civil war inside Russia being inevitable. Russia is locked down in a repressive police state. Who's going to organize this civil war? But uh, that's exactly the reason for the civil war. Uh, you know, if uh, if there would be uh, uh, political liberties and the Russians would be able to participate in the elections, obviously they would turn to ballots uh, uh, to get rid of uh, Vladimir Putin in the legal way. But uh, what Vladimir Putin learned uh, and, and taught Russians uh, uh, very accurately is that there is no way uh, to get rid of him through the elections process. And that's why the only uh, thing is a violent protest. And uh, because right now in Russia, there is a growing number of people who were trained at the fields of war and which are returning being very unhappy with uh, what they saw in Ukraine, and many of them are armed. Uh, so that's the direction it goes. There's no organized political force in Russia, you said. There are people who are dissidents and political activists and are against Putin and want political change, but they are disorganized. To turn disorganized groups into the kind of groups that would stage a civil war, and could organize effective armed resistance to the government, what needs to happen in Russia? You shouldn't confuse two different things. Uh, when you're saying the word resistance, what I was saying, telling Kiev Post, and I still stand on this position, that uh, yes, there is no organized opposition in Russia. There are opposition-minded people, but there is no opposition. They, they, there are no political parties. There are no uh, non-government organizations. There are no uh, legal networks of people who are ready to uh, 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 give a fight, but political fight, legal fight uh, against uh, the current government. They are either in exile or in jail. But in terms of uh, resistance, if we are talking about the violent resistance, uh, this is uh, growing right now exponentially. Every single day we see no new and new attacks uh, in uh, the Russian territories on uh, military recruiting posts, on the uh, police cars. Uh, recently it was uh, already a more serious thing. It was a suicide uh, drone that attacked uh, a refinery which belonged to uh, Viktor Medvedchuk, one of uh, uh, Putin's cronies uh, that is active in, uh, in, in Ukraine. And that's a major attack. It was the uh, refinery which uh, which went a blast. Uh, uh, so I think that this movement would be growing, and it it, uh, it doesn't need to be uh, organized. There are a lot of uh, groups that are scattered across Russia, and they are grassroots. And that we see that those attacks that are coming in virtually every every single city. That actually shows the political demand for an action uh, like this. And that's why I'm very optimistic that this regime would fall soon. Mr. Pandamaryov, you these days you run a media venture in Ukraine called February Morning with the express purpose of bringing down Putin's regime by, I suppose, reporting the news that Russians can't get from their own journalists and promoting active resistance. You said our job at the end of the day is an uprising of the masses. How's that going? As I'm saying, it's, uh, it's uh, happening in, in front of our eyes. It's, uh, it's happening every single day. Uh, we have more and more news, uh, like I just said, to uh, report. And uh, while uh, classical uh, liberal journalists are leaving Russia, we, vice versa, are uh, uh, 
uh, spreading inside the uh, the country. We currently have 27 outposts within the country in 27 cities. We are opening a Moscow bureau when everybody is evacuating. We are, we are doing this because we have people who are not afraid uh, of uh, being prosecuted, who are not afraid of being oppressed, who are fighters. How many people do you think are tuning into your channel? Right now it's half a million. That's more or less the audience. And uh, would you take credit for some of the uh, armed in attacks that uh, you've been talking about? Some. Some? You're, some. A little re you're a little reticent about that. No, look, uh, uh, we don't uh, want to be branded as international terrorists, right? So we are helping people. Uh, we are not claiming the responsibility, but uh, we are assisting them. As the war has gone on, how far do you think Putin's aims have scaled back? He didn't get to Kiev, but he started shelling it again. Do you think he will push again towards the capital? I think he will try. I think he will try. I think that's what uh, he is trying to get from uh, Belarus uh, President Lukashenko. Uh, I think that uh, one of the uh, possible things that Putin is asking him is... Uh, uh, to go in Lithuania and uh, to cut this uh, Suwalki corridor uh, that connects uh, Belarus with Kaliningrad uh, and to provoke conflict with NATO. I think that's one of the directions that uh, Putin really wants Lukashenko to go. Or alternatively, uh, to move uh, to Kiev, to start another offensive from Kiev. Do you think he wants a fight with NATO? I think that Lukashenko wants to avoid it. But uh, uh, Putin, Putin. Is, uh, Putin wants definitely Putin 100%. It's an itch that he can't get rid of, is it? Uh, it's not just an itch. He wants to crush NATO. Uh, uh, that's his strategic goal, to crush NATO. And uh, the way it may happen, if he would provoke a, a kind of conflict where NATO would not properly respond, if, uh, say, an attack of uh, one of NATO members would actually happen, like the attack on Lithuania, but NATO would not invoke Article 5, uh, then NATO is redundant, right? Uh, what's, what's the point uh, of its existence? And, and he would like uh, to prove that it's redundant, presumably. Yeah, absolutely. That's what, that's what he would try, tries to do. He thinks that Germans, for example, uh, would not uh, dare to fight uh, with uh, allied Russian and Belarusian uh, forces with a nuclear threat. And that's why for him it would be very convenient if uh, uh, this assault would be uh, made by Belarus and not Russia itself. Because at, the, at this situation, he would be very much in the gray area. It's like a confrontation not with Russia, with another country, but this country acting as Russia's proxy. Uh, and it would create a lot of chaos uh, within the Western establishment to determine uh, how to react. And that may result in, uh, in Article 5 not being involved. This uh, desire to provoke a fight with NATO, is that why we're seeing the level of anti-Western rhetoric mounting? Well, that, uh, I think that's uh, more targeted to Russia's audience uh, because he needs to keep the society consolidated. He needs to get the uh, society aligned, uh, allied uh, behind his back, uh, that they would not listen to enemy voices like us in, in February's uh, uh, morning. Uh, but uh, the strategy already uh, stops working. We see that Russians, they lose interest uh, uh, towards military rhetoric and they start to ask more and more questions about the domestic economy. And this is something that they obviously want to avoid. One of Putin's United Russia MPs, uh, Andrei Gurulyov, said recently that uh, they'd already chosen which Western city would be hit first in the event of a World War III scenario, and that honor would go to London. Is that bluff or a serious threat, in your view? Well, obviously, uh, uh, in every uh, parliament in the world, I think that there, that there are some crazy people who like to uh, say different crazy things just to get more votes uh, during next elections. And the Russian parliament right now is especially rich uh, with uh, such people. Because, uh, one, one guy is, is telling about nuclear attack on London, another guy is telling about renouncing the recognition of independence of Lithuania, forgetting that there was the same act that uh, recognized uh, 
independence of Russia. And uh, if they would renounce recognition of Lithuania, then uh, Mr. Gorbachev should step back as the president of the country. Uh, but uh, these guys are just completely out of their out of their mind, but it's very uh, uh, profitable for Kremlin uh, because uh, Putin uh, with with such a lies uh, looks like a very reasonable guy. And that's what he wants to uh, to tell the West, uh, you know, you better keep me in office because if not me, you know, it would be those guys coming. Let's go back, if we may, to your time in Russian politics. In, in 2014, you belonged to one of the smaller parties in the Duma, the, the lower house of parliament, and you achieved notoriety by being the only member of that assembly to vote against the annexation of Crimea in 2014. Did you not think in doing that that you might be signing your death sentence? Um, I had some ideas, yes. Uh, and I was uh, preparing to go underground. I was thinking that I would be uh, physically pressed, uh, pressured uh, immediately after that. And uh, I prepared all the set of documents and the hideouts and, and, uh, and everything. But looks like it was uh, personal Putin's decision. Uh, who decided otherwise. He uh, decided not to punish me directly, but to neutralize and in their mind like pushing me outside Russia was a way to neutralize me in Russian politics. But you were featured on a billboard in Moscow, weren't you, which labeled you a, a national traitor? How did that yeah, make yeah, you yeah. feel? Yeah, a national traitor, that's actually uh, something that was invented personally by uh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, this word uh, first time appeared in Mein Kampf, uh, which he wrote, and now it's... Uh, it's uh, part of vocabulary of Mr. Putin, and as the result of uh, all, uh, all his surrounding, all, all, all his all his crimes. Yes, and it was in billboards in Moscow and in other cities with my face, uh, but uh, also some other pretty nice uh, faces because uh, they also put uh, certain rock musicians there uh, who sang protest songs, and I actually liked them. I like the company. So you were in good company. You were in good company. Yeah, yeah, so I was very. I'm very proud. I have those photos with me, and uh, you know, it's something to, to make my heart beat stronger. You've suggested that the system in Russia needs Putin to survive. You you pictured him, I think, as a as a spider at the center of his own self constructed web, saying that without him, that web would die. Why do you believe that? Isn't his system fully in line with the repressive structures that Russians have had to endure for centuries? Oh, no, actually, uh, what uh, Putin uh, accomplished is destruction of all institutes of power. Uh, it was uh, very visibly demonstrated in 2008 when they uh, switched places with Dmitry Medvedev. At that time, Russia was very much the parliamentary republic because the power shifted with Vladimir Putin into the government. And he was like a, a partisan prime minister, uh, very much like in Great Britain, you know, on the surface. But uh, in, in reality, no institutions work. There is no parliament, uh, there is no government, uh, there are no security forces, and there is no even a president. It's just Vladimir Putin and people uh, who are his cronies. That's it. Uh, and uh, that uh, makes the country very vulnerable, but it also makes the system very vulnerable. Putin have done it deliberately so that he would not be removed because everybody, all the uh, uh, parts of this uh, web, they understand uh, his importance. They understand how he keeps the balance. So they understand that without him, they would not survive. And so they're interested in keeping him as a spider in, in the center. That's his personal security. But in, in a way, the Russian people still support him in very large numbers. It's impossible to say exactly how large the numbers are. But what does it say about the Russian mentality that repressive stability is considered preferable to freedom? Um, you know, it does not say much about Russian uh, mentality. It says much about the uh, uh, horror and the bad days of 1990s, where Russians were really scared with the economic house, with poverty, with the destruction of the country. 
And uh, they don't see an alternative to Vladimir Putin. That's what he's trying to do. He never says to Russians that uh, I'm the best of the best uh, and, you know, vote for me and then whatever. He's just telling me, maybe I'm not perfect, but others are worse than me. And if you take any of those opposition guys, they all are people from 90s. Even Navalny grew up from uh, the establishment of 90s, so they will return you to the times of Boris Yeltsin, and there is nothing worse like that. And Russians say, okay, 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 maybe you are not perfect, maybe you're even corrupt, maybe you have bad people around you, but better to have you than to go back in that direction. As soon as Russians would see an alternative to this, which looks positive in their eyes, this regime would collapse, you know, within a week. The, the Russian writer Vladimir Sorok Sorokin says Russians themselves are to blame for Putin and especially his war. Clever people, he says, have had 20 years to work out who Putin is. In the early years, oil prices rose, living standards improved, and people turned a blind eye to the autocratic excesses. They wallowed in luxury, they traded their conscience for material well-being, and now they're reaping the reward. Is that fair comment, as far as you're concerned? I think it's very much on, on, on target, and uh, that's what makes me really uh, sad. We have uh, in Ukraine this discussion whether good Russians exist. And to my mind, there are no good Russians. The uh, good Russians would emerge when they would replace Vladimir Putin. Then those people who would replace him, who would stop the war, who would stop the aggression, who would stop the bloodshed, they would be the uh, good Russians. And I feel very much sorry, my good friend, uh, uh, which I really love and adore and very much respect, uh, Dmitry Muradov, the uh, Nobel Prize laureate uh, um, uh, for, for, for uh, peace and uh, the guy who uh, just sold his uh, Nobel uh, Prize medal, uh, raised 100 million euros and donated them to Ukrainian uh, children. It's a very humanitarian act, which I applaud, but at the same time, he's Russian. If he would uh, donate the same hundred uh, million to replace Vladimir Putin, uh, may maybe Vladimir Putin would be gone already. Uh, but nobody is right now assisting any uh, activities to actually stop this regime. And that makes me really sad and make me feel whether, whether there are good Russians. You still offering a million dollars to anyone who can bring Putin dead or alive to a war crimes tribunal? Yes, and uh, there were people who uh, followed the lead, and uh, right now I've heard already several announcements, which uh, even higher than this uh, one million, and I heard several uh, announcements for different uh, people in Putin's establishment, which also are higher than than a million. And I think it's just a matter of time when uh, you know, such actions would start uh, to be executed in Russia. We talked at the beginning about current losses on the battlefield. How far does the public mood fluctuate when people hear news like that? Is, is the will to fight as strong as ever in Ukraine? Yeah, I think that the morale is, uh, is very high. Uh, people uh, are going more and more disappointed with the position of the West in general, uh, probably with uh, the exception of Great Britain. Uh, that's uh, what we see currently as our strongest ally, uh, thanks to the Prime Minister, um, who is very popular in Ukraine right now. But in, but in general, uh, uh, people are upset with the West because they feel like uh, the West uh, is giving just enough uh, weapons uh, to resist Russia, but no, not uh, enough weapons uh, to fight back and, uh, and to liberate the territory uh, of the country. That's how it's been seen within Ukraine. Will they be encouraged by the statements of support that came out of the G7 meeting? I'm talking particularly about the commitment by the French and British leaders to work for Russia's defeat in the war. That was explicitly said. And that seems to have been spelled out more clearly than before. Is that of some comfort to people, do you think? Uh, of course, that uh, gives uh, certain inspiration, uh, but uh, definitely weapons would be more useful. I, 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 I would be frank uh, here. Uh, firstly, I think that uh, the West is still shy uh, to say in public that we need to replace Vladimir Putin. Without his replacement, this war would not stop. I think it's very much obvious. Uh, you know, it's like uh, in World War II, you know, people would say, 
let's help uh, separately uh, France, Great Britain, and uh, Soviet Union, but would not say, uh, uh, let's defeat Hitler. Uh, I, I, I think that we need to say it openly and in public, that Putin needs to be replaced. What kind of Ukraine, what kind of Russia do you see emerging in the end from this conflict? Frankly speaking, I think that at the end of the day, those countries uh, would be very much alike. I think they both would be democratic. I think they uh, all would be free. Uh, I think they all will be very much decentralized with power to the people at the grassroots uh, level. And I think they both would be members of European Union and they both would be members of NATO. So uh, a bright obvious. future if we can avoid World War Three. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's our joint task to avoid it. Ilya Ponomaryov, thanks very much for being on Conflict Zone. Thanks for having me.